What's up Sparring Homers, my name is Aaron, and in a previous video I showed you guys how I built a network rack for my network and Sparring Home equipment. It was my first ever rack and you guys gave me a lot of suggestions, so in this video I'm going to do 4 or 5 upgrades that I think improve my setup quite a bit. Now you're going to have to excuse me because I definitely have a cold and sorry if my voice sounds annoying, but I hope you can bear with it and you enjoy this video. One thing that a few of you guys mentioned was an uninterruptible power supply or a UPS. It's actually something I was planning on including in my last video, but it wouldn't fit the budget and I couldn't find one that I actually liked, so I ended up not including one. Power outages not only cause a hassle, but they can actually damage your network equipment, so it's a great idea to have a system that can stay powered for short outages. The role of a UPS, if you don't know, is to instantaneously switch power from mains to battery backup when mains power fails. This portion of this video is sponsored by Golden Mate and their 1000 volt amp UPS they sent for me to check out. First of all, this UPS looks really good. I searched around for quite a while looking for a UPS that I thought looked decent because this one's going to be displayed somewhat in the open and this one was the best one I could find. While I'll be keeping this thing underneath my network rack sitting on the top of my workbench, you could keep this thing on a desktop if you wanted because it looks so good and since the fans run at less than 50 decibels of noise, it should be fine to keep out in the open. The Golden Mate UPS has a lithium iron phosphate battery inside of it, making it very lightweight for the performance you get. This is nice if you want to install it inside a network rack because network racks do have a maximum weight and you don't want to overload them. It has 230 watt hours of capacity, meaning it could run at 230 watts of power usage for an hour or 460 for half an hour, etc. It uses advanced pure sine wave technology, which significantly reduces the likelihood of overheating and damage to your sensitive equipment. That's super important for a UPS, and honestly, it's a requirement if you're getting a UPS for a network rack. On the back side of the UPS, you have four outlets for connecting your equipment. These outlets have built-in surge protection to prevent equipment damage from voltage spikes, and while I'm only using two of them, it's really nice to have all four just in case. The front has a nice bright LCD screen that shows incoming power, outgoing power, and uses symbols to let you know if the device has power or not. Now let's go ahead and test this thing with a light bulb in this light socket. I'll plug the bulb into the back of the UPS and the UPS is plugged into power in a wall socket. With the bulb on, you can see that there's power incoming from the wall outlet and you can see about eight watts going out, which is the rating of the bulb. Now when I unplug it from the wall, you can see that there's a brief flicker and then it goes on to battery power backup. That brief flicker is only about 20 milliseconds, which means your computer or network equipment should stay powered during that little blip. Notice that when the UPS is no longer plugged into mains power, the LED in the bottom corner begins to blink and it emits a beeping noise. That beeping noise can't be turned off as far as I can tell, but it's not super loud, although it might be if you're out in the open. You can see that now there's no power coming in, but there is still power going out, and that's coming off of the battery. We can go ahead and try this with my workbench PC, which uses a little bit more power. And you can see that once again, when I unplug it, it switches right over to battery power and notice that the screen is still on and nothing has changed because it was too short of a duration of being off while it was switching for anything to happen with my PC. According to Home Assistant, this entire network rack before my upgrade only used about 50 to 55 watts, and I've been monitoring that with a power monitoring plug, so this UPS should easily be able to handle it with any upgrades. I'm actually now powering this entire rack plus my workbench PC with this UPS. Even with my main editing PC, which uses between 2 and 400 watts, depending on if it's running actively, and that includes all the peripherals and the LED lighting around my desk, this thing should still be able to keep all of that powered for at least half an hour. Plenty of time to finish editing or whatever I'm working on and save before I lose power. Thanks to Goldmate for sending me their UPS to use in my setup and for sponsoring this portion of this video. One other thing I want to say about this UPS is that I saw some reviews on Amazon that there was a really loud fan noise and that there was weird smells coming from it. And all I can say is that that has not been the case for me at all. This thing has stayed super quiet and has had no issues at all. In my last video, I showed how I was using the TerraMaster direct attached storage system with a Zima board to act like a network attached storage system or a NAS. And while that's been working great, I really felt like I should have a dedicated NAS and not be using two different devices as a NAS because that means two different points of failure. I reached out to TerraMaster to see if they'd send me one of their NASs and they agreed to send me their four bay 
F4 424 desktop NAS. It not only has four bays of storage, but it also has two M.2 NVMe slots for hybrid storage. It also has eight gigabytes of DDR5 RAM, but that's expandable to 32 gigabytes if you think that it's not performing as fast as you want. On the back, you can see that it has two 2.5 gigabit LAN ports, a 10 gigabits per second USB-C port, another 10 gig USB 3.2 Type-A port, an HDMI port, a power jack, and a power button. Setting this thing up was so simple that it was surprising. I took the two four terabyte drives that I had in the direct attached storage, and I put them into this thing, and then I put it in the spot where the direct attached storage was before. I plugged in the ethernet cable and power and started it up. The drives got formatted, and then I got everything set up in RAID 1 format. Using the PC app, you can easily map the NAS to your PC as a network drive, and you're good to start using it as network storage. Also, the software is really simple to use with an app store that has a small collection of apps, which include Plex, TerraMaster's photo backup software, and a few others. This is probably the one downside of their NAS is that the app store is pretty small, but there is a community store where the community is building apps, and I've even seen that you can run Home Assistant on one of these. It does work really well for a simple data backup, and just like the direct attached storage, I can edit 4K video off the NAS with no issue. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to move my Plex server over to this thing, but just getting the video files over is nice because now I don't have two points of potential failure, I just have one. I think this situation is a lot better. Now in my last video, some of you guys asked why I used a patch panel instead of a brush panel, and I actually mentioned at the end of that video that I kind of regretted not using a brush panel, but I had already kind of committed to the patch panel, so that's what I ended up going with. But this time, I decided I'm going to do it right. Previously, I used a keystone patch panel to redirect all of the cables that come out of the TP-Link network switch back towards the back of the rack to connect to all of my devices, but that really meant an extra connection point, which really isn't necessary. I went with this simple brush panel from Navepoint and installed it in the place of the patch panel. I used some longer patch cables so that I can make connections from the TP-Link Ethernet switch back through the brush panel and all the way down to my devices in the rack. I needed those longer cables because I had removed those short patch cables that went from the front of the TP-Link to the front of the patch panel. To reduce the distance a little, I switched the bottom shelf with most of my smart home hubs with the one that was holding my DAS and UFI home base. Then I just routed the cables from the ethernet switch back through the brush panel and down to the devices in the shelves below. The brush panel is really cool because you can slide the cables around to organize them the way you want and the brush blocks you from seeing into the rack and you just see the cables popping out which looks really clean. I don't think it looks as clean as the patch panel but with a little bit more work I think it could look just as good. You guys also asked in the last video why I used Cat5e cable in some cases instead of Cat6 and honestly the answer is because I thought it didn't matter. I know that Cat6 cable does have higher data transfer speeds and has a larger bandwidth but I thought I wouldn't need it. But thinking back, that was a pretty silly decision. And although my internet is limited at 100 megabits per second, I want the maximum data speeds I can get internally on my network. So if I'm accessing files or data on my Plex server or my NAS, my data transfer speeds can be the fastest they're gonna be. The last and arguably the best upgrade that I've made to my network is something that so many of you guys suggested. If you didn't see my last video, I was using the Google Nest Wi-Fi system and I was telling you guys how much I couldn't stand it. I would have random internet drop-offs where I'd have to unplug and plug the router back in to restore internet, and sometimes the mesh access point would just drop off, and I'd have to unplug it and plug it back in and hope it reconnected. And worst of all, there was very little network customization, and any of it that you wanted to do, you have to do in the absolutely garbage Google Home app. This was so frustrating to me, and so I was looking for your suggestions, and most of you guys suggested the Ubiquiti Unified Network System. I guess you guys just like to see me spend money. The second most suggested was the TP-Link Deco Wi-Fi system, but I decided to go with Unify because I'm a huge fan of the modular design of the system, as well as the customization options. I bought the Unify Dream Machine Pro and two U6 Plus wireless access points to start out with. Setting up the UDM Pro was super easy, and if you want a dedicated video of me showing how I use it in my smart home, let me know in the comments. One of the things that is so awesome about the Unify network system is that it can be added to Home Assistant and monitored and controlled there, which makes your automations in your home super powerful. It suffices to say for now though, that since I've been using this, I totally get the hype. 
You know the feeling you got when you switched away from Google Home or Amazon Alexa and to Home Assistant? The feeling that anything was possible and any customization you wanted to make, you could? That's the feeling you get when you switch to the Ubiquiti Unify network system. The UDM Pro itself acts as a network router, connecting to your cable modem and allowing for internet connection to anything plugged into its eight ports. However, it does not broadcast a wireless access point, so in order to have a Wi-Fi network, like I did with my Google Home Wi-Fi, I had to get those two U6 Plus access points. Now these access points are powered over ethernet and the UDM Pro doesn't have any PoE ports to power them. And while Ubiquiti does sell PoE switches and it also sells a much more expensive UDM SE that has PoE switches, I decided to use a TP-Link PoE switch that I already have to power these. I plug those access points into the TP-Link switch and once they were adopted into the Unify network, Boom, now I have a Wi-Fi network. I gave this new network the same credentials as my old one, and all of my old devices started connecting to it with no issues. Even the devices that I had reserved IPs, they connected to this new network with the same IP. Now I did have to go into the settings in the Unified Dream Machine Pro and change the gateway IP so that it was the exact same as the Google Nest gateway IP, but after that, no issues. I installed one U6 Plus access point downstairs in one end of the house and the other one upstairs at the other end of the house to cover my 2700 square foot house. Now one of them was covering the entire house but it was a little flaky on the edge so I wanted to for spotless coverage. Now if you saw my last video you know that this rack was already super full and you're probably wondering where did you put the UDM Pro and I'm going to answer that by giving you a little tour of this network rack in its final state like I did in the last video. Okay, so like I mentioned before, I have the UPS down on the workbench underneath my network rack, but everything in the network rack is plugged into the UPS. On the bottom shelf, I have this Tech Mojo power supply that I showed in the previous video, and it has these pigtail outlets on the back, so I can plug in a ton of wall warts. There's plenty of room for power. On the next shelf, I have the NAS, as I mentioned before, and next to that, my test instance of Home Assistant on a Raspberry Pi in the Pyron Man case. And next to that, I have the Eufy Home Base Station 2 for my Eufy cams. On the next shelf, I have my EcoWit hub there in the back. I have the SmartThings Hub V3, my Zima board, my Hubitat hub, my Akara hub, and I've added my Home Assistant Green on this rack. On the next shelf up, I have my Home Assistant Blue, which is my absolute favorite device that Nabucasa ever worked on. It runs my main instance of Home Assistant. It's been rock solid since the day I got it in 2021 or whenever it was. Next to that, we have the Reolink NVR, which records all of the video streams for all of my Reolink cameras and doorbell. And above that, we have the brush panel, as I've already shown. You can see how clean it is with all of those cables coming out of the brush panel. And it's so easy to modify or change position of the cables. And those cables come up to the TP-Link switch, which I also showed in my last video. Now, previously, I had an 18-port PoE switch above that. But I realized that that was a little bit overkill for me. And since my plan is to use real link PoE cams, I can just connect them to the NVR and I won't need that many PoE ports. So I decided to remove that and put the UDM Pro in its place. So even though I got rid of that PoE switch, I am going to need PoE ports for future access points if I add any more. So I'm thinking I may actually swap out the TP-Link switch for Ubiquiti's standard PoE switch, which has 16 PoE ports and eight regular ethernet ports. I can always branch off those ethernet ports with another switch if I want, but it will give me the PoE ports I need to add more access points. Using Ubiquiti switches gives you more control over your network. Like you can actually turn on and off PoE switches. You can even turn them off via Home Assistant, which is really cool. However, this costs a lot of money, so I'm gonna to have to save up and add it sometime in the future. So that's pretty much it for this one. And like I said in a previous video, your smart home network rack is never really done. And I've already thought about a few changes I'd like to make to this one. For example, I thought about getting a rack mount NAS instead of this desktop NAS, which would save a bunch of space. And I also thought about moving this real link MVR up to sit up on top of the rack, which would open up some more space. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this major upgrade to my network. And if you guys want to see part three of this adventure, let me know in the comments because I'd be happy to show you my upgrades as I go along. If you guys see something I could have done better in this video or something that you really like, let me know in the comments and get subscribed because I also have a workbench upgrade video and an office upgrade video that I'm working on. Anyway, thank you guys a ton for watching. See ya.